man, it gets to be an emotional story as well. But I remember being on my club team in Colorado, born and raised in Colorado Springs, single mother, right? Low income. We were, we were on food stamps for a little bit. And then she just got too proud. My mom's of Korean descent and just started working extra um, hours and a lot of overtime. So she's been a hotel housekeeper for 37 years now at the wow. Broadmoor Hotel. So I get a lot of my blue collar work ethic, ethic from her. Um, and I remember going, playing on my club team at the time and going to a team meeting and she could never be at these team meetings just because she was working. And so, you know, I had great friends still to this day on the teams that would pick me up and, and drive me to training. So they'd pick me up and drive me to this training or this meeting and a coach that I adored, literally, I loved this coach. I loved him. And he was at the board and we're getting ready to go to our first showcase ever as a team. And this is where you're finally getting in front of college coaches and it was going to be an amazing experience. I think we're going to go to Cincinnati Blue Chips, which is at the time like the number one uh, showcase. And he goes, okay, we're going to reach out to coaches for you. Um, what schools would you like us to reach out to or, or make initial contact with? And I just jumped up. And at the time, you know, I've been reading Soccer America. Um, and so knew essentially the top 10 schools. And I start yelling out like Duke, Wake Forest, um, Yukon, Creighton, Santa Clara, UCLA. I just started, I was so excited to start naming these, these schools, these big time schools. And he looked at me and he goes, James, let's get realistic. Right. And so this is in front of everyone. Parents are there, players. And again, I, I adored this coach. And so I sit down, everyone laughs and I just kind of sit down. I think I'm 14, 15 at the time. And the meeting goes on. And then my, one of my good friends, father drives us home and he's usually pretty upbeat and he was dead silent in the drive home. And I, so I think I'm thinking I did something wrong and he dropped his son off first, which he never did. And so I'm like, what, what did I do? Right. And so I'm sitting there and he drives over um, to drop me off. And, and mind you, the, 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 the income disparity is, is unbelievable. I mean, there's a highway and they're very, they're very affluent and wealthy, all both business owners, but good, good people. And then they drive over to, to kind of where we live. I would say, you know, middle to low income, not like crate, right? We, 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 my mom just worked hard and did well with the money that we had. Um, and so he drives to drop us, drop me off. And he usually just kind of parks on the side of the, the sidewalk and drops me off. This time he pulls into the driveway, turns the car off and parks it, looks at me and says, James, don't you ever let anyone tell you you can't, you can't do something or accomplish your dreams. He goes, if you want it, right? Put in the work, let's set up a plan and, and we'll execute accordingly, right? In those words. And so just that belief in me was huge, right? And so a belief in someone that that I admired and also loved was just, just tremendous words. And, and again, to back up in the story, my father left before I was one. So I've been in the man of the house for a long time, had a stepfather that was in and out, but not a deep relationship with him either. And so I really treated my soccer coaches. They were essentially father figures. So on the same day to have one of my biggest soccer coaches that I loved and adored kind of tell me to get realistic and kind of minimize my dreams. And then to have another fit father figure say, no, you can't accomplish this, right? This is how you do so. It was huge. And the coach that, that minimized my dreams didn't see the work I was putting in behind the scenes. I didn't see it. It's all I had. I couldn't afford one-on-one -on -one coaching. I couldn't afford soccer camps. Um, and so I had a brick, a cement wall in my garage. And we talk about the 10,000 hour rule. I eclipsed that times 10. I mean, I, I spent so much time on this wall, just, you know, cassette tapes, CDs, just playing music, playing on this wall and just visualizing, right? And not necessarily visualizing playing pro, just visualizing my success and visualizing having fun on the field. And it was just my time just be, you know, fully expressive. Um, and so that story, honestly, I, I tell everyone that's kind of my epiphany story. And I usually tear up when I, when I say it. So I'm glad I was able to catch myself. But again, it was just the belief in a coach. And throughout my career, it's always been coaches that have said that. So then I get onto that, finally go up and play with the Colorado Rush. And you just had coaches that just said, I believe you can make the state ODP team. And so I'm like, what is that? You know, you should try out the state ODP team. Try out, make the ODP team. Then you get to the ODP team and, and that coach goes, I think you can make the regional team. And then I'm like, what's that? And he tells me, he's like, okay, this is what you have to do. And so then I go there. Then you make the regional team. Then you have my regional coach says, I think you can be one of the top players at this regional event, right? Make the top, you know, top 11 at the regional event in the national pool, what have you. 
Um, and back then ESP was the big, big camp, right? The, the, the Adidas elite soccer program. So you, you had the Cocoa beach event, which was the regional event. Then you had ESP probably six to seven months apart. One was in November Thanksgiving and the other one was in the summer. And I just lit up both of those. And then by that September, or I think it was July one, when coaches could finally call you college coaches. I mean, my phone was blowing up. I was getting so many letters. I, my mom couldn't believe it. And it was all because I just put in the work behind the scenes and I had a belief in myself, but it was instilled by a coaching father figure. Um, so I always tell people, right, never let anyone minimize your dreams. But the biggest thing is you have to make sure that your daily habits align with that. If you have dreams to say play in Europe here and your and your daily habits are way over here, like it just doesn't align. So even today, I never tell players to to change their dreams um, and goals. I should never be able to minimize those for you. What I will tell you and what we will address is your daily habits and to make sure they're aligned and congruent. And so ultimately that was my biggest story. And so throughout my career I've had, especially through college have, my coaches have been father figures. I just spoke to message Jay Vidovich, who was one of the biggest influences in my soccer career. He was the head coach at Wake for, I don't know, 20 plus years or so, or maybe just under that, but saw literally saw a scrawny 115 pound player from Colorado Springs and saw me not for what I was at the moment, but what for what I could be. Um, and that was just special to me. So a little bit long winded, but that epiphany story for me is, is, is kind of essentially my journey, kind of being the underdog a lot and then just putting in the work behind the scenes that no one sees. Um, and that was just kind of been kind of the, the, the theme of my career. No, oh, I mean, James, that's powerful, man. Um, and it, it touches me because I was raised by a single mom. I was raised by a single mom that was diagnosed with polio since the age mm. of four. Mm. Um, and I was in a household of people that were, no one was athletes. Everybody was in the educational field. Mm -hmm. So at, athletics is a source of hobby right. and everybody's like, when the hobby is done, go and get a real job. Mm -hmm. And for me having to pave a way to, um, go against it, I know how it feels. And sometimes that moment where you hit it, mm -hmm. you get emotional, you get yeah. teary because yeah. it felt like you're at it alone, but yeah. there's a few coaches or someone that we always remember that constantly either were by your side or you, they weren't the believer they were, like the way that coach mm -hmm. said, maybe those are unrealistic, but you make them into believers. Mm -hmm. You're like, looking back, you're like, man, all of the coaches that were saying that's a little bit too high now are all by me now. Yeah. Now they're like, it's, it's funny how life works in its time where, when you're a small fish in a big pond, yeah. you become that big fish in a smaller pond. Right. It, it, life, is, it has that full circle. And I think... Um, nothing is always unachievable. I yep. think you just have to surround the individual like yourself that had the right work ethic with the right mentors, the right mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. system, because if you're going to be willing to put in that work day in, day out, mm -hmm. and the right people are telling you how to do it and how to map your path, then, you know, you don't miss the boat. Right. You know, so that's huge, huge. And thank you for sharing it. Of course. What I want to kind of touch into, and you kind of touching on it, is one of the main parts of this podcast. It's the mindset. 